Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number 570 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Folks, I am talking about the future of EDA, the details of DVCon 2024, and the feasibility of artificial intelligence for design verification with Tom Fitzpatrick, DVCon 2024 Conference General Chair this week. I also investigate the fastest, lightest, and smallest mini-robots ever created. But first, please welcome Tom to Fish Fry to talk all about DVCon 2024. Hi, Tom. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So first, give my audience a rundown about DVCon. When is it taking place and who should attend? So it's taking place March 4th through 7th at the Doubletree in San Jose, in California, where it's always been for about the last 25 years or so, at least that I've been going. It is generally for design and verification engineers, managers. Occasionally we get some executives, but they usually just come for the parties. The technical content is really geared more towards practicing verification and design engineers. So uh, anybody that does this for a living is going to find it very useful, I think. Fantastic. Now... This year's DVCon is slightly different than previous years because you guys have now one panel and two keynotes instead of two panels and one keynote. So first, tell me about those keynotes. One of them is given by Paul Cunningham from Cadence, right? Yeah, he's actually doing a joint presentation with Anthony Hill from TI. So one of the things I'm, I'm trying to do this year, we started kind of last year. So Siemens had the keynote last year, and instead of... The Siemens EDA doing it, we actually got uh, Dirk Descalo, who is the overall Siemens CTO, to do the keynote and really to try to raise the level of context, if you will, right? So instead of just worrying about what's the next cool thing that an EDA company is coming out with, it's more about how does EDA and the chips that we develop fit into the larger ecosystem of everything that's going on in the world, right? We do still rotate main keynotes between the major three EDA players, so it was Cadence's turn. So I asked Paul to kind of do the same sort of thing and give a broader perspective. So he's going to talk a lot about evolving the landscape of automotive SOCs. So he'll talk about kind of what Cadence is doing in that area, but also bring in Anthony to sort of give what TI is doing with the things that they develop using the tools to put into the kind of larger view of things. So we're trying to help people really see beyond just the horizon of what's the next EDA thing coming out. Tell me about the panel, which is called, When Will We Be Able to Say EDA GPT? Verify My ASIC. Yeah, so this is going to be kind of fun. It actually is a Siemens presentation, although I had nothing to do with it. So it'll be moderated by Harry Foster, who I think most people know. He's actually our chief scientist for verification at Siemens. And it will include people that are knowledgeable in particularly LLMs and sort of understanding kind of what the state of the art really is. And if it's even feasible to think about having uh, artificial intelligence actually do our jobs for us. The panelists will include Eric Berg from Microsoft, who uh, I actually met last year at DAC. He did a really nice presentation on using ChatGPT to sort of get rid of some of the grunt work that he deals with, everything from meeting minutes to, you know, other stuff. Daniel Shostak from ARM and Mark Wren from NVIDIA, as well as Dan Yu, who is from Siemens. He's our AIML solutions manager. Harry and I actually co-authored a paper with Dan that's going to be presented at another session at the conference. So yeah, it's going to be looking at, is it even feasible for using LLMs to verify design, right? Verifying a design is much different from identifying pictures of cats, right? So the idea of being able to train an AI model to actually do verification is a really interesting topic. And I think it's harder than most people think it's going to be. So it'll be interesting to hear their perspectives on whether or not those of us that do this kind of thing for a living need to worry yet. So there's also a wide variety of technical sessions offered at this year's conference, right? Yes. So talk to me about the different themes of these sessions. Sure. So we actually have several types of sessions. So Monday and Thursday are tutorial and workshop days. 
So Monday is Accelerate Day. We start off with a few tutorials. So there's a portable stimulus tutorial from Accelera. I'll put in a shameless plug for that one since I'm also the chair of the Portable Stimulus Committee in Accelera. So that one is going to be on using portable stimulus for essentially programming designs for memory subsystems and kind of understanding how to use portable stimulus to create portable tests from block up to SOC level and sort of initial bring up and that kind of stuff. So that's going to be some really interesting practical considerations about that. Cadence is doing a tutorial Monday morning, I believe, on functional safety verification. Synopsys is doing one on low power verification from UPF to sign off. So those will be all on Monday. We also have a number of Accelera workshops on Monday, including IP exact, so UVM stuff, and also have other workshops from Arteris and Agnesis on, on Monday. Yeah. Thursday is going to be interesting though. So in addition to give another shameless plug for the Siemens tutorial, similar to Cadence and Synopsys. So that's going to be on data-driven design verification for RISC-V SOCs. We have a couple of other workshops from Cadence and Synopsys, as well as Viavia Labs is doing a system C model code generation using LLMs. So uh, a little more thinking about that. Real Intent is doing a, one on static sign-off. Breaker is doing one on RISC-V verification. And we actually have a new contributor this year, Perforce, is doing one on automating the integration workflow with IP-centric design. So it's always good to get new participants. So getting Perforce into this is going to be kind of cool. So that's Monday and Thursday. And then Tuesday and Wednesday, we have the sort of, I'll say, traditional papers, sessions, and posters. So we have 42 technical papers that'll be done on Tuesday and Wednesday, everything from AI and machine learning to formal verification. We actually have a lot on analog and mixed signal this year, which is interesting. We have two sessions on that, risk five design and verification, UVM, system Verilog, tips and tricks kind of things, and functional safety. And we also have about 20 posters on a wide range of subjects as well. So, Tom, I saw that there is a poster ninja warrior contest. Tell me more about that. Yeah, that's going to be really fun. We started it last year, although we kind of sprung it at the last minute. So not everybody was exactly prepared for it. So as I mentioned earlier, we have about 20 posters that are going to be presented. And so from those 20, the top four will get selected based on attendee rankings. And then what we're going to do is the poster warrior contest. So those top four will do a five minute presentation on their poster and get questioned by our panel of experts from our technical program committee. Based on that, the answer to those questions and the audience reaction as well, we're going to pick the top three for the best poster awards that'll get presented later. So that should be a lot of fun. Uh, last year, it was attended pretty much by just about everybody. The popcorn was gone within about 30 seconds. So we're hoping to get a little more popcorn this year, but it was definitely a lot of fun. Everybody's really into it. We've told all of the poster authors this year to actually prepare in advance a five minute presentation on their poster. So last year, we kind of took a few people by surprise, but they should be ready this year. So it should be a lot better. We're looking forward to having some fun with it. That's cool. So what would my audience gain by attending this year's conference? Well, I've been going to this for a long time. And even though most of my attendance is on the presentation side and you know behind the scenes kind of stuff, I've actually learned a lot myself. So one of the things that I've seen is the attendees see some really practical examples of some state-of-the-art kind of stuff going on and talking to folks, but whether presenters who tell me about people that came up to talk to them afterwards to get clarification or attendees that come up to me and, you know, thank me for the quality of the program as well. There's a lot of practical knowledge that can be gained and a lot of collaboration as well. Everybody that attends is very happy to share ideas. Some of the questions that get asked at the end of the sessions are themselves very insightful and can actually take the presenters in different directions a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's a really great time for learning how to do your job better, as well as to make friends and, you know, <laughs> reconnect with the people that you see once a year for 20 years, right? That kind of thing, too, is always fun. I love it. All right. It is time for your off-the-cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? Uh, what food or where would I eat it? Uh, either one. <laughs> Wow. Uh, well, let's see. that Lent is coming up, uh, I guess now would be the time to pick uh, probably a really nice filet mignon, garlic mashed potatoes, and probably some, some kind of vegetable, a very small serving of vegetables, followed by a nice apple pie, I think would probably be it. 
very very much uh, mainstream you know american food <laughs> I, don't, I don't get very adventurous a lot of times with food so. that sounds good to me awesome well it was a pleasure speaking with you tom thank you so much for joining me oh thank you very much thanks for the opportunity i hope to see you and a lot of other folks at dvcon let's talk about mini robots but not just any mini robots how about the fastest lightest and smallest robots ever created. Get this, a team of researchers at Washington State University have created two different insect-inspired, fully functional micro-robots that weigh in at only 8 milligrams and 55 milligrams, respectively. So, there is the mini bug, which is the smaller of the two, and the water strider, which is the one that weighs in at a whopping 55 milligrams. And both of them can move at around 6 millimeters per second, which is way faster compared to other micro robots at this scale, but certainly not as fast as their biological relatives like the ant, which can move at about a meter per second. So the key to the success of these micro-robots is in their actuators. This team used a new type of fabrication that allowed them to get that actuator down to less than a milligram. And yes, if you were wondering, that is the smallest ever known to be made. So these actuators use a material called shape memory alloy that has the ability to change shape when it is heated. And it also remembers its original shape and can return to that first state when cooled. Another interesting aspect here is that these alloys don't contain any spinning components or moving parts like typical motors do. So why don't all robots use shape memory alloys? Well, they aren't great for large-scale robotic movement because they're just too slow. But since these robots are so small, this kind of technology, which requires only a very small amount of electricity or heat to make the motion happen, is great. In this case, the actuators were made of two shape memory alloys alloy wires, which were only one thousandth of an inch in diameter. So in addition to the small amount of current, these wires can be heated and cooled quite easily and allow the robots to move their feet or flap their fins at up to 40 times per second. Okay, so what kind of potential applications are we looking at? Well, these kind of robots would be great for environmental monitoring, microfabrication, artificial pollination, search and rescue, or even robotic assisted surgery. Super cool, right? So if you want even more information about these new micro robots or more information about DVCon 2024, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I completely understand. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And, of course, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, 
Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of February 23rd, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.